So now they're running into chemical shortages, which one of the persons there was like, yeah, if you can forward buy, I don't care what it costs you now, you forward buy it or you, there's a possibility you might not get it. I mean, it, it, they always say there's a possibility, but the way I interpreted it was you buy it at any price because next year it's not available. And I'm thinking, all right, what is that list? Oh, it's everything. It is literally everything of a chemical or a fertilizer that goes into the farming process. Here's uh, front page zero hedge. The food crisis of 2023 is going to be far worse than most people would dare to imagine. I don't know if he's talking about us because we imagined it for some time now, and here it is. And I do welcome you this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, wherever you live on this beautiful blue planet. I got some exciting information to share tonight. I was presenting at a dairy conference in Nashville and what are the dairy producers and the world's largest grain companies in the United States? What are they thinking about fertilizer and the actual supply of the grains, mainly corn for the feed? And the transition into renewable diesel, which is just absurdity in itself. So I'm going to walk through a couple things. Just a distant early warning. The highest levels of food production in America are trying to secure anything at any price right now because they know they might not be able to get it. You might want to take a, a cue or a note from that. Follow the money. And luckily I was there presenting and a couple things dovetailed with you know the information that they're looking for in terms of fertilizer production is one of the main things. Grains and food supply inbound it's going to have a significant difficulty moving in 2023. I was there to talk about the Tonga eruption, which happened in January of 2022. Not many of you heard about it. We had this massive eruption from Tonga, which was at least twice as high with the ash ejecta into the atmosphere as Mount Pinatubo, which cooled the Earth seven tenths of a degree Celsius. Well, this is on par to cool it around one and a half possibly two degrees Celsius. So I marched through all the temperature data on all these South American countries experiencing a record cold, record cold, coldest September, coldest uh, June, July. And you could really see the onset as the months are progressing, the cooler temperatures are actually visible in the temperature data record now. So when they release, uh, like in Paraguay and Uruguay and Chile and Argentina and Brazil, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, once they released their data, it really shows significant cooling. I was really shocked. You know, Chile in some areas is five degrees Celsius cooler than the averages over 30 years right now. And, you know, the crop guys were there. They're like, 5C, that's a, that's a zero yield out of there. He's like, even 3C is a significant almost. You'll be happy to get anything at all. Anything. Now, this is where we're going into in the Southern Hemisphere. So all these traders and everybody up here is petrified of the availability of food, fertilizers, uh, farm inputs, pesticides, herbicides. But at the same time, they're like, okay, we'll just see what happens in the Southern Hemisphere. This is a let's see because that's kind of the way the market moves. All right, we know it's atrocious up here. They were talking literally of the amount of food not being grown. We were down 700 million bushels this year in America. 700 million down. So when I, did, I wasn't unaware of this in the pipeline. So there, we had a supply chain guy that I was really deep into. That's all they do is shuttle barges for grain down the Mississippi and on rail. Like usually they'll get the grains in the Midwest, but everything's failed. So they're way over in Ohio buying grain, trying to move it across the, uh, the states. But not enough labor in the rail supply. So they're, they're constricted there. They can't move. Barge traffic's locked up across the Mississippi River. They say it's going to take until, what was that? April or so for any of this, if it were to, under perfect circumstance, wind its way out and let the supply chains function correctly and evenly again. That's what we're looking at. And that's what these heads of the largest dairy farms in America that provide your milk, your whey, your protein powders, onward for baby formula, etc. And they're marching through all the things that are about to be affected. Now, some of the stuff with the cattle genetics is this crazy one, too, because they were talking about Methane reductions, because, you know, the whole methane thing, they're trying to demonize the uh, dairy industry and the cattle industry. It's too much methane, too much methane. Sheep got to go in Australia, New Zealand. So what they're doing is they're doing genetics of the cattle. So certain types of cattle that they found, the way they process the food releases less methane. So in the genomics, they're, they're saving those embryos, IV, into these other cattle to try to produce the next generation, the next generation. And they say there's about a 5% reduction in methane. 
I'm not going to say GM cows. Not they, they don't genetically do anything with it. They just choose the species and then save an enormous amount of embryo and then um, have that birth on to the next generation. And they're saying that each successive cattle generation, about three years, is going to reduce that, that cow's output will be reduced by five percent. So they're saying by 2050, which is bonehead idiots up in Canada, we're saying this is the uh, Canadian Agricultural uh, Association, Dairy Association, had set itself a target to go zero emissions by 2050. So they already locked themselves in a corner. Like, why would they do that? But anyway, they're saying, okay, so from now to 2020 to 2050, that's 30 years. We should have 10 generations at approximately 5%. So they were looking somewhere between 30 and 50% methane reductions by using genetics out of the cattle. So these are the kind of things that they're on to already. And, uh, you know, Ransom, I'd like to go through it with you because, I don't know, we're seeing a lot of strangeness happening, and this is really shaking me awake to the point where, you know, these guys that are contract growing on 100,000 acres – couldn't get their crops out. Total losses, they call it burn down. And another thing is crops, when they're harvested, they usually do an average over a county or a part of a state with multiple counties that are coming in on an average when they do the crop tours on the local side, not the USDA or the pro farmer tours. Generally, when they go out and they'll run through the crops, it'll be a local assessment from the local co-op. But what they're finding this year, they can't bunch anything in, uh, in averages anymore because the losses are so spread out. They're saying it's, it's the largest amount of variability in crops that they've ever seen. So literally across the street, you could have a burn down zero yield. And then across the street, you could have 100 bushels an acre. You could have 200 bushels an acre literally across the street. So they can't do average yield any longer. So this is creating a backup in the data that you're going to receive. So hang loose. You're not seeing any of the losses yet. Now, could this be an excuse as why they're waiting so long to put data out? It sounds like it is a perfect excuse to not release the data until later on in the year and then create the panic around Christmas or New Year's, Thanksgiving time. You know, I have a pond and it's full of black swans. There's like 50 black swans out on this pond swimming around. That's kind of the takeaway I got after hearing all these dairy and cattlemen, grain producers, shippers, and logistics talking and like I said, these are the top of the top of the American markets and also into Europe. And it's sitting there listening, and Canada, excuse me, both, all Canada. It was frightening to listen to it, knowing what I know. And then I added the volcanic emission reduction of temperatures and the crop losses in the southern hemisphere. And you just see their eyes and they're, oh, man, they're smacking their foreheads going, oh, and how are we going to get grain for our cattle? And then this goes into the whole lease lands thing. And I don't know, man, there's so much to digest after that. I just, I was almost, almost numb to see what's coming. Really, it was numbing to see how much damage there's been in the agricultural industry that's not being reported on. It is, you know, it's still taking me another day to just like realize, just put in a realization and take notes and figure it all out because it is catastrophic. Anyway, Ransom, I'm rambling. And thanks for joining me tonight. I'm here with Ransom Godwin. What are you seeing in the world? Like, we're going to frame it as turds in the punch bowl now. Your move. You going to fish that one out or what? No, I'm not. I'm not an apple bobber kind of guy. I don't know. I'll stay away from the turd in the punch bowl. That's how you get COVID. I never, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's the same old news. And you know what? Uh, a little bit, I'm feeling like Nostradamus because we've had these discussions before and I put out a couple predictions. One of them would be that, you know, 2023, obviously, we've been talking about that. That's going to have a bunch of food problems. Here's uh, front page zero hedge. The food crisis of 2023 is going to be far worse than most people would dare to imagine. I don't know if he's talking about us because we imagined it for some time now. And here it is. The naysayers that were kind of saying, oh, you, you know, it's doom and gloom and fear porn and all that. Well, now it's all catching up. The global food crisis is a term that everybody's using in all of the countries because it is a real situation. It's not make-believe. It's, it may have been created. It may have started out fictional, but now it's completely nonfiction there. 2023, is it going to be far worse than most people would dare to imagine? Well, I imagined it pretty bad. I hope it's a lot better than that. But here's some other predictions that we talked about. Remember, I said that this year would be the first year that they put publicly battle droids on the field in uh, war situations. So that has now happened. Uh, the Netherlands has deployed four armored ground robots or unmanned ground vehicles. 
And this is just a, a little step into that to get you used to the idea that some of these conflicts that I'm sure are about to sprout into new areas are going to be somewhat unmanned. It's ironic that Elon Musk put out that cheap $20,000 robot that could barely walk. It looked like he could kick it over. They have much better stuff than that, and so does DARPA. Mm-hmm. They're all going in this direction of AI, and I've said it many times. Part of the project for a new American century outlined by 2025, we would have a completely AI Air Force. And if you've been paying attention to recent events, a lot of the military or traditional military people that were in careers have recently left not only the Air Force, the Army, the Marines, the Coast Guard, etc. Another prediction that I said would be that right around this time, After the U.S. got rid of all of its old military hardware, which we know they've been doing a bunch, and all of this stuff is going into the arena of the Ukraine, Uh, not just the robots, but all of our old material, we're all getting shipped in there. And I predicted that right after we did that, we'd pop out with the new tech. And here it is right here, the Northrend Grum Man, if I could talk right. And they're not the only company, but all of these military companies are about to show their new toys that they have. So Northrum is about to put out the replacement for the V2. This is supposed to be a game changer, according to them. And this is in a time where, let's face it, China's military is catching up to the U.S. Here's front page MSN continuing to talk about how China's military is emerging as a true competitor to the U.S. under Xi Jinping. And they go on to talk about how many millions of service members that they have but not just that, that they ha- they have just completed and shipped out their third a- aircraft carrier. And this third one is the first to be designed and built in China. So you can predict they're going to keep on pushing out more and more naval assets. And th- this is where it's going. So we're all preparing for a world war. It's right out in the open. And in the backdrop is this food crisis of 2023. So war, famine, and disease. This is a pre-planned project to completely replace what we call food and usher in a new era of controlled um, starvation is basically what it is. Getting people used to eating these rations, we've talked about it, but it's all coming true right now. It's not a story. It's not going to be, you know, in the future. It's not something we have to worry about for later. It's all coming together right now in real time, and you can see it people are openly admitting that they are causing war, famine, and disease for the good of the planet. That's my translation. So no telling, you know, what card they're about to play, but uh, they're all big and they're all negative. So if somebody's out there waiting for this one single event that's going to change the world, let me tell you, there have been millions of little events over the past couple of years that have already irreparably changed the world. So let me address a couple of those points on what I had learned and listened to over the last four days. Now, in my presentation, I was talking about electrical demand in Europe has nowhere remotely reached the peak demand that will occur in November, December, January, February. Now, there is a cycle in electrical usage that you can see it going back as far as they've kept data in Europe. The periphery seasons like spring and fall, people are not running the AC too much. They're not running the heater too much. It's like that Goldilocks temperature zone for a good four months, maybe five months of the year. You get those two, two and a half month blips on both sides of the winter and the summer. Summer's not so uh, warm, you know, depends on where you are. You, You might not even need to run the AC. You can run fans. But as we move forward into what is beginning right now, so as we come into the end of November, they're starting to spike up. December, January is the ultimate peak right along with February, and then it starts to drop off. The thing is, those who were trying to obtain fertilizers have come to the realization that there will not be any coming out of Europe at all this year. None. The thing is that the the governments over there, and this is firsthand from myself of some of my contacts in Europe, that the governments over there have decided to stop all industry and re-divert that power into the homes because they understand that street protests and violent overthrows of governments in the middle of freezing, starving citizens is a no-go. So they're going to sacrifice business through the winter, and they're going to try to restart it in spring when the electrical demand is dropping 
and then they can take that and move it right over to the factories. And at that point, they watch it. You talk about forecasts in March and April of this year. There's going to be you're going to watch all this news come out asking people to use the least amount of electricity as they can with the understanding that, you know, we let you survive through this winter by turning off all industry in Europe. And the least you can do is turn off and lose, use the least amount of power you can possibly use so we can re-divert that and start our economy back, which will be atrocious at that point. It's already atrocious anyway, but like double atrocious, triple atrocious. And at that point, we're going to start the economies back up, but you just don't fire up a steel refining operation. You don't just fire back up a zinc smelter. And one of my contacts from BASF in Germany, no less, said that their plant, and I'd ask him because I'd read this before. After World War II, they started this one chemical plant in 1953. It has never shut even one day. Now, from the original plant that they built, it is now six square miles. And he tells me that they don't even waste a single molecule in a process, that any process that's done, if there is a byproduct, not a single molecule of gas is wasted. So find a way to make a new product from that, knowing that this will be a stream coming off of another process. The problem is they are going to start shutting this plant down. And he says to me, you know, when they try to restart this thing, the pressures and some of the things that haven't had a lot of pressure on it because it's been a continuous open flowing system that they've never ever since the 50s even turned any of these valves and gears levers down to zero and then tried to start it again and equalize pressure so nothing blows out on the o-rings or the pipes themselves or there was glass tubing and just a huge amount of infrastructure that could be damaged with too high of pressure so they're fearful that when they shut this plant down or even parts of it that they'll never get it back up and running again. And they're definitely not talking about this with the German public. And BASF being one of the largest chemical producers, huge problem. That is just one of the 75 chemical plants that have closed down. I mean, down to zero. Zero. There's nothing coming out of there. Nothing. And it's going to continue as they roll through high demand I had talked about the electrical demand. I showed it in a chart that I did, you know, my presentation in the morning, overlapping the volcanic eruption in Tonga and the southern hemisphere crop losses and showing those charts that, you know, if you think it's bad now in Europe for nothing coming out, it's going to get less than zero. But the things that are about to happen and the breakdowns in the supply chain, their main concern is if Ukraine will get back open again or not, if those ports will be functional or not, because if they are not then what you know is global agriculture has collapsed down into a global famine. They cannot get the crops. Everything that you can possibly think of was just absolutely ripped to shreds this year, like the canola crop. They were talking about just being so tight that it, massive losses in Canada. Well, you would expect that going into the grand solar minimum. And they were talking about cotton crop being the lowest since the, you know, the late 1800s. And then the cotton seed and the press cake coming out of that is minuscule and almost non-existent. So there has to be substitutes for these things on the animal feed side. There's one company that was in there talking about uh, feed efficiency, trying to tailor the ultimate diet for a cow based on their genetics to almost waste nothing by the time it comes out the backside. But the efficiency of getting every single gram of protein into that animal and see, the thing they're finding is with this genetics to reduce methane, the fat content is measurably decreased. And the amount of milk production is also measurably decreased when they go to the cattle genetics to remove the methane, which is going to be all the rage. So as you look across the landscape here, the crops that we understand as being crops, corn is down. It's going to be a record loss. Like they literally don't have even categories to put the losses into. It's so outside of anything recorded, except the year without a summer in 1816. So overlapping data from the Pinatubo eruption and what was reported with Tambora, we still have three more months of cooling to go in the Southern Hemisphere before it even reaches the coolest. And uh, the, the shuttle guys, these are corn shuttle guys, they, they move corn around on barge, nothing coming out of Ukraine, 
they're hoping that the uh, agreements from Russia will be uh, re-agreed upon and it can continue to 2023. And I am absolutely unequivocally stating with a fist on the table here, if you hear that that agreement between Russia and the Ukraine is not ratified again, this will plunge our planet into a global famine of the likes we have not seen for hundreds or thousands of years. This is how dire it is in the industry, the way they're talking about it. Their hope is pinning on the Ukraine that they can get fertilizer out of there from Russia and they can get some corn and now wheat coming out of the Ukraine. The problem is, which I've talked about before, the grains have been sitting in those silos and storage and warehouse facilities for well over a year now. Because that's last year's harvest. That's at the same exact time that never got moved out. So now they're in a rock and a hard place. They never moved the grains. They didn't store them well. There's been a lot of people in a war, you know, just electric turns off. People aren't there. Lights aren't turned on. Rats get in, whatever. They're finding a huge, huge, huge amount of damage on the crop that's been stored. That's non-exportable anymore to EU standards. So they got like, I don't know, 10 plus million tons just laying around that they can't export anywhere. And now their new harvest is coming in. But... The numbers that they had were only 30% of the fields got planted this year in the Ukraine. 30, 3 zero, compared to the 100% that was a year ago, two years ago, 2019, 18, 17. Okay, that in itself is a startling. But the problem they're going to have is they have nowhere to put the grain. They're literally going to need to use machines to empty those storage bins out. And we are talking massive port facilities. Literally scoop by scoop by scoop with an excavator or they just open it and dump it into the sea to then make room for the new crop that's coming in because the only option for them currently is to leave that crop out under tarps. That's the only choice they got. And you, know, you start adding all this stuff up and then the, the fertilizer shortages from that you know, Ukraine, Belarus, Russian area was a major, I didn't know, the reliance we had on that. And here's another scary thing. The potash, I didn't know this, on the American border with the Canadian border, it's the second largest potash reserve in the entire planet. Why are we importing fertilizer? And this is the same thing they're asking because price of production for an American worker in an American factory to go dig that out, process it, take it from rock into chip. It's cheaper to do it over there and then import it into America than we can do it and go dig it ourselves. That's sickening. So they never really developed the, the area because it was always just cheaper to buy it somewhere else imported. It was already packed in the bags. It was already loaded for you. So now they're running into chemical shortages, which one of the persons there was like, yeah, if you can forward buy, I don't care what it costs you now. You forward buy it or you, there's a possibility you might not get it. I mean, it, it, they always say there's a possibility, but the way I interpreted it was you buy it at any price because next year it's not available. And I'm thinking, all right, what is that list? Oh, it's everything. It is literally everything of a chemical or a fertilizer that goes into the farming process. This is where we sit. Now, the United States, according to their data and presenters that I was listening to, the United States will be the last place that will feel what the rest of the world will feel first. So if we're having a food price crisis collapse street protest because of food prices in America, then the rest of the world's on fire already. You're going to get some lead time into knowing that it will arrive here. We're already seeing street protests in, what, 30 countries across the world at the moment about food pricing. At least 30. There's only 198 countries in the world, and 30 of them are battling on streets because their food's too expensive. Like, at some point, it's going to roll to 50 countries, and the next it'll be at 100 countries, which will be half the planet. Like, once you see that 50% rollover, we have very little time in the United States to prepare because it will come here last. We have the most land. You know, we can do everything ourselves, but it was just so cheaper to do it elsewhere. Everything manufacturing processing has just been let to die on the vine out here in America. It's been the, since the Clinton era. And they were talking about how things were outsourced down to Mexico and everywhere else. You know, we have a very viable agricultural industry here that we could produce ourselves with our own fertilizers. And if we could have our own chemical factories, but the greens are yapping, not in my backyard, and with the steel plant shutdowns in Europe, that means that the tines and different kind of disc high rows 
and replacement parts. They're talking about how much stuff breaks. Every everybody in there is there. Did you do you have a, a disc hyro break and that needs to be repaired? And everybody raised their hand every single year. And they can't get steel. They're like, we're already out of the repair parts. That's the whole thing too, is the equipment repair parts, the shortages that are everywhere too. They literally can't get like those round discs that plow the field to repair. So they're going to have a gap. Okay. They may be running, you know, a hundred foot wide, but you might have one or two gaps in there where the, where the disc isn't. And it's just going to leave a gap. So then they're going to reduce uh, yield off of that because there's a gap. It can't plant. It can't till. It can't rip. Drills too. They're like talking the drill bits. Every time they're drilling these seeds into the soil, those things are plugging up, cracking up, breaking, bending all the time. Like again, if you don't have a driller to go in there and like set that seed in, then what? You know, these are the very real problems that are here with us and most technologically advanced in many ways agricultural business on the planet. And we sit here at this edge of catastrophic collapse. And that whole Bill Gates thing, if I might follow up and add with one last point here, Ransom, is Bill Gates thing, and we see him buying land. He owns 250,000 acres of land. He's one of the largest or is the largest agricultural land holder. But if you look at the tens of millions of acres in America, that's really just a pittance. It's nothing. Unless you start to look at the water rights involved with those purchases. He is not buying farmland. He is buying the water rights in regional areas that has to go through his gate first before the rest of the, the growing areas will get it. And that's what his purchases are about. And I would encourage everybody out there to take a look at the, uh, the amount of farmland Bill Gates has purchased in each state. And there's many, many maps of this. And then you can drill down by state and look where the water Rights are held and where these rivers flow through and every single 100% of his ownership land will be an aquifer or a river th flowing through the property at, I wouldn't say even the start point. It would be more at the catch point where it starts to really um, fill itself. And if you were to turn that off, you're turning off a main line. He's not really worried about the small tributaries coming in to fill lakes, rivers, dams, estuaries, etc. He's focused on where that collects. And then the downstream from there is where the major amount of water comes in for agricultural production across the United States. Got to go through his farm gate before you get your water.